Hi, Jamie. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> it's so great to see you today, and I really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for being supportive of creating this podcast with me today and creating the podcast idea with me all over again. Yay. You were instrumental in that. So I appreciate you. I always appreciate your wisdom. I'm looking forward to sharing more of your story mm -hmm. with everyone who's listening and talk about all things love. Yes. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm -hmm. Well, it's delightful to be here. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Yeah. You're always welcome. Well, it's such a lovely space. I might just take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So should we start simple with where were you born? I was born not right here, but in this fair city of Portland. Okay. Yeah. You grew up here. I did. Yeah. I'm a little bit jealous of that. And <laughs> where... Did you actually grow up? Yeah. Well, I started in West Lynn mm -hmm. before West Lynn was like the hip place to grow up. And my father is a builder. And so he built our first house that we lived in. He's actually built every house that we ever lived in throughout childhood. And then at age probably six, they bought 20 acres in Oregon City at the end of a dirt road. And there were two creeks, and there were forests, and a canyon. And so we lived there in an apartment above his shop. And then he built a house, and we moved into that on the same piece of property. And then, then the last move or iteration was kind of selling that part five acres off with the shop and the apartment and the house, and then moving across the canyon to the other side and building a big house over there. Was it a more beautiful spot? Is that why you guys chose to move? <laughs> no, the reason we chose to move is because my dad was obsessed with not being in debt. And so he figured if he sold this parcel, then he could get out of debt. He could use the profit from that to build the new place and then, you know, achieve financial mastery. That sounds yeah. a lot like you. Oh, God. Well, they say that sometimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but hopefully in some ways it has. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it sounds like your practicality. You learned your yeah. practicality from him. Yeah. Because we've had conversations about debt, too. Absolutely. He maybe has Capricorn in his chart, too. Somewhere. Maybe he does. He's a Libra, and I don't really know that much about his more specific birth chart, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. very, very boots on the ground, you know, money in the bank, everything paid off kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, so you lived on this piece of property out in the middle of nowhere. And for yeah. people who are watching or listening, West Lynn is like half hour from Portland. Yeah, it's like right down 205 from Portland. It's a suburb. It's one of the more affluent areas now in Portland, I would say. Um, but it was up and coming then. So we kind of got to see it develop around us, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it? Was it cool back then? I think it was kind of like the frontier back then because I was born in 1979. And so it was really like the 80s when everything was being built. And I remember my mom taking me on a walk around the neighborhood and throwing rocks in people's ponds and, you know, watching houses being built. And there was this one house that they had made out of, gosh, it was like old um, – munitions covers from the war so it looked like a star wars house and it, you know it had all these little domes and pods and there was a pond right by there that seemed really far away at the time and my mom would I'd have her throw rocks because i couldn't make it all the way down there but you know yes it was more eccentric i would say westland still was in that affordability bubble back then um which is probably why my dad was out there building in the first place because yeah that's how he rolls and um and it got cooler what was it we like there. growing up there? Well, I remember it was very much a neighborhood, and it was off of this street called Carriageway. So there's this area called Hidden Springs that has had several different iterations or, you know, builds and developments, and it's high on a hill. So one of the things I remember is looking out from our back deck, and you could see Mount St. Helens. It looked north. You could see um, Mount Hood, and it was just this 
epic view because there were no houses <laughs> obstructing the view. And so it was really um, amazing. I remember feeling like I always want to live up high. This is so cool. And then having lots of friends because it was a neighborhood, you know. Yeah. So I remember going over across the street to visit the neighbors and my best friend lived two doors down. So you weren't isolated? No. Okay. We went from being very much in a little community okay. to being really isolated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And when did you get more isolated then? When we moved out to Oregon City. Okay. Because it was literally, we were at the end of the a dirt road. road. Yeah, that's what I thought we were yeah. talking about. Sorry. Yeah, and our, yeah. our nearest neighbor was a five-minute walk away. Okay. You know what I mean? So it was just like yeah. forest. Yeah. Which is... So what was that like? Well, that was cool because my mom would just turn us loose and say, come back when you're hungry. Because nobody was worried about anything bad happening because you were out in the middle of nowhere. Like... Don't worry about the cougars. There's no strangers. <laughs> right? Or snakes. <laughs> or, or snakes. Anything or, else that yeah, might be. bobcats, small <laughs> black bears. I don't know. They're like, the kids won't drown. We have them in swimming lessons. So <laughs> it was a really unstructured. Okay, it was. Childhood. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Um, which, is, which is great. And so that probably has... Um, contributed to your <laughs> love of land, right? Uh-huh, for mm -hmm. sure. In fact, when I got the thing we call cancer when I was eight years old, um, one of the things that they told us to do, because my parents took me to alternative healthcare practitioners before it was cool, you know, we went vegan, they had me doing all of these vitamin supplements and mineral supplements and, and mental health care as well, massage. And one of the things they said was, find your favorite place when you're feeling stressed out or if you get scared or whatever, like in your mind, go to your favorite place. So I found my favorite place on this land and it was this old cedar tree stump that was an old growth. You could still see where they had put the jump boards in for the loggers to saw down the tree. And a new tree, a new cedar tree was growing up beside it. And it was right overlooking the creek, this bend of the creek. So I could go there and I could lay on this stump, which was so big. And I could listen to the creek under the shade of this cedar tree. And so that was, it just got called favorite place. And it's still called that to this day. And my dad ended up putting a cabin down there. And so, you know, it's just the love of the land 100% was in my blood from a very young age because that's where I spent all my time and where I'd go to find refuge when things got overwhelming. Okay, so you dropped the cancer word, and mm. most people listening or watching ha don't know anything about that. Yeah. So do you want to fill us in a little bit more about what you're referring to? Yeah, the, the cancer word was kind of the first initiation, I would say, well, conscious initiation um, into this bigger perspective and – orienting around love as being <laughs> the driving force in my life, although I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at that time. Because for me, when I was seven years old, almost eight years old, I remember having a very specific moment overhearing my mom talking about someone at our church because I was very much raised in a cult also, and they had gotten cancer. And I remember thinking in my seven-year-old brain, I hope I never get that. It would be the most horrible thing that would happen to me. I would die. Like, boom, full stop. And then a couple weeks later, she's brushing my hair. I had really long red hair when I was small. And she starts feeling around. She's like, what's that? And there's a lymph node on the back of my head that's swollen. She takes me into the doctor no, oh, kids get lumps and bumps all the time. Don't worry about it. Another one pops up a couple weeks later. Another one pops up. So by the time it's getting on Christmas, like my whole face is just a swollen mass of these lymph nodes, you know, and I'm getting more and more tired and I can't walk on my right leg for some reason. 
I had a mortal dread of doctors and all things medical establishment. Bef Already before. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, from a young age, it's one of my mother's favorite things to tell everyone is, like, all I had to do was say the word doctor and Jamie would just collapse into a gale of tears. You know, so there was a huge block there. And now I'm having to go see them all the time. And they're saying, well, we should probably biopsy now, do a little surgery, remove a lymph node, send it off, get it tested. So I go under the knife and anesthesia and all of this stuff. And how old are you? Eight years old. Okay. Yeah. And um, they get the results back and they say, oh, cat scratch fever. Give you some antibiotics. No big deal. You'll be fine by Christmas. What is cat scratch? What is cat scratch? Fever? <laughs> I know. Why would it be giving you lumps all over your head? Right. Right. Well, wouldn't it be giving you a fever? One would think. Yeah. I, what did I, I know? know? I need to Google yeah, it. Yeah. Do some research. Cat scratch fever. Weird thing that happens sometimes when cats scratch you. Big immune response. Oh, okay. Lymph system is your... Okay, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. cleaner. Okay. Your cleaners. We had been to a wildlife safari down in Bandon, Oregon a couple months before. I'd been scratched by a little baby mountain lion. He was so cute. Um, and so they were like, oh, obviously that's what is driving this whole flared immune system. So you got misdiagnosed. Misdiagnosed. I did not know that. Holy cow. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm getting puffier and puffier, more and more tired. We're in our Christmas processional, which takes us down to the Napa Valley to visit my grandparents every year. Um, and I've gone through another biopsy because they're like, okay, we didn't, we didn't nail it. Better send it off to Stanford this time. So they, they've sent it off to Stanford. We're in Napa, and we get the results back on Christmas Day. And my parents tell me on Christmas Day <laughs> that I have cancer and that we have to leave immediately for the hospital after presents have been opened and everything, you know. And, and so we do. And we get there, and they have to start an IV on me, which I've never had done when I'm conscious. I'd had one in surgery, but never conscious. Just remember having all these nurses hold me down, eight years old, being held down by all these nurses. They're trying to start this IV. You know, I mean, it's just like, are you fucking kidding me now? And then the real moment or turnaround happened a couple days later because they – it's a teaching hospital, the University of Stanford, right, or Stanford University. So they've got all of these med students. They're doing rounds. They're standing in front of my bed, and they've already done a spinal tap on me to try and figure out, you know, what's going on. I'm partially conscious when this is happening, despite the fact that I'm supposed to be completely unconscious. <laughs> And they're like, yeah, this one has probably about 50% chance of survival. This is a really rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We have one case in medical history that has survived, you know, all of And you're And I'm it listening all. to all of Not this. Not that your higher self wasn't listening, but yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And something inside me just stood up in that moment and was like, I'm not fucking dying. You don't get to tell me when I leave and when I stay. And the next day, the lymph nodes were half the size that they had been the day before. And a couple of days later, they were completely gone. And so, so that was how it all started. And um, I, I ended up getting congestive heart failure from one of the chemotherapies that they used um, a year in to a two-year protocol. So they were like, well, <laughs> guess we better take her off it. Hope she's clear of cancer. Turned out I was. So that was lucky. So I went into remission for a year and then had this dream, like almost a year to the day, laying on my floor in my bedroom thinking, oh, it's coming back. I'm going to have to do this again. And sure enough, at my one-year checkup, the doctor said, Oh, what's this? Wah, wah, wah. My job, right? So back in again, I went. This time they had to use different drugs. This time they were like 20% chance of survival because, you know, like <laughs> we didn't get it all the first time. And that was when Make-A-Wish stepped in and asked me if I wanted a wish. 
And I credit them with giving me the injection of hope that I needed to be able to muster the will and the desire to live. Um, it was I, that impactful. It was because I knew that Make-A-Wish was an organization that granted wishes to kids with life-threatening illnesses. And it was like having the doctor stand around my bed again but this time with a carrot, <laughs> like, we think you're going to die, but before you do, do you want this cool thing? And what that did in me was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to live, and I'm going to choose a really fucking amazing wish that is going to live with me through this and beyond just to show you all that I don't go when I don't want to, <laughs> right? And so I wished for a Morgan horse. A and, Morgan mm -hmm. horse. Yes, very specific. So you had a Pinto before, mm -hmm. and now you got a Morgan horse. I got a Morgan horse, Okay, and they did this. Do you like, want to explain to anyone what a Morgan horse is? Uh, the most amazing horse ever. It's the best <laughs> breed of horse in the world. <laughs> yeah. What makes them so amazing, They're Jamie? so amazing because they can do everything. I spent days and weeks researching like what is the most versatile all-arounder awesome beautiful powerful horse breed out there and I came up with Morgans because um, they're an American breed and you know they can jump and they can do English and they can okay. do western and they just go forever and they live a really long, long time. time how long did yours live well Jetta was born in 1977 and um, we ended up selling her when I went to college College. So to my knowledge, she's either still living in Eastern Oregon with one of our old doctors, or she probably lived to be about 35 or 40 years old. Wow. Yeah. Did you show her? I didn't, okay. which is funny because I totally intended to. That was like one of the big dreams. But because we lived in the middle of nowhere, my dad was <laughs> cheap <laughs> as fuck. He was like, not I'm not tactical. buying a horse trailer. <laughs> you know? Or the saddle. Or I had the else. saddle. It was just the horse trailer was the stickler, okay. which I was like, weird thing to be all up in your frugality over. But OK. Yeah. So well, you weren't no thinking showing, that when you were eight. But yeah. You know, I was just mad. <laughs> he wouldn't buy a horse trailer. <laughs> You're like, I want it. I want it. Yeah. I want it. And I just proved that I can overcome anything in order to yeah. Yeah, have my dreams come true. Exactly. So why won't you show up for me? That's right. Oh, God, story of my life. Woof, boy. That's another, <laughs> <laughs> another subject altogether. Oh, but you can ask me anything. So okay. it is fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, that was a really, I mean, you led me in a direction that I had questions for. Um, can you name something that you can't live without? Oh, wow. That is a really good question. The first thing that came to my mind was hot water. Because <laughs> I... <laughs> I know. Why? Okay, let's just go with it. Hear me out. Okay. I was actually standing in the shower a, a year or so ago <laughs> just thinking, you know, every time something happens to me that I need to relax from, just like get my thoughts on straight, I go to the water me and too. I get in my bathtub. It me is too. a daily ritual. I love it. And mm -hmm. I have always loved it. Me too. And I was... <laughs> Of course, <laughs> little Pisces Scorpio um, goddess. And I was thinking, you know, if the apocalypse happened, because I was raised, you know, to think apocalypse was just right around the corner growing up in the cult and everything. Yes, if, we got to touch on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when apocalypse happens, um, I'm going to have to leave, right? Like have my bug out bag ready. Like where do I go? And I thought, I would miss my bathtub so much. Like, how would I manage my stress levels if the new Cascade or the Cascadia fault line goes and, you know, the earthquake happens and everything goes down like hot water? Because my therapist is going to be who knows where and I'm not going to have access to yoga classes with I'm friends. I'm just going to drive. If the I'm roads are driving. even passable, I'm you know? I'm going to get a four-wheel drive car. Get a four-wheel drive car. And just drive over the meridians. I don't care. You're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I will back road it. I don't care. I was like, I'm going to find where the closest hot springs is, and I'm heading there. That's smart. Because then... You can just hang out in the water. Just hang out in the water. Mm -hmm. Plus, 
you know, you've got hot water, you can do a lot of things. You can make technology that runs on geothermal power. Oh, look at you. So anyway, hot water. I, I would just drive south where they didn't have the er earthquake. Or South. drive <laughs> to California. <laughs> drive east. Better. Better yeah. choice. Yes. Well, no, I didn't mean, I just it's meant like, south yeah. from my house yeah. so that I didn't have to cross <laughs> the river is what oh, I mean. Oh. That's the first thing I think of. It's like, so at funny. least I'm on this side of the river in Portland, so I don't well, have to cross it. You're. I would drive south until I didn't have to cross the river and then I would drive east. I'm just trying to think about like where, where that would be because you have I-5 crosses the Willamette River just south of Wilsonville. So you'd be able to make it to there before you had to figure out what to do. I would drive to the beach. If the beach was still there. If the beach was still there. Because <laughs> I read that anything sort of west of I-5 was just kind of done for. What? what? I read that the, <laughs> the, the potentially, but there is a mountain range in between me and the coast. So True. potentially I could be okay. True. But that said, it mm -hmm. depends on how big tsunamis are or whatever. But right. that said, if we're talking about the end of the world, uh -huh. um, I I heard that the other side was worse because oh. it's – like even like the airport is uh -huh. built on sand. Oh, yeah. There's that. Plus yeah. the Columbia River. I mean right. the tsunami just like roll, roll right up right from through. Astoria and be yeah. like done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See you later, Trowdale. Yeah. Well, yes. Yes. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully I'm further south of that. Anyways. You are. And you're up higher. higher. You're like yeah. on the hills. So mm -hmm. yeah. you'd be fine. But what can you not live without? <sighs> <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind, not kidding you, is my pillow. Aww. Yeah. I, I cannot live without my pillow. Because it's the special pillow. Yeah, because of the neck injury. Exactly. I can't sleep on a regular pillow. Wow. And it gives me a migraine. Okay, so do you... Like, it's, it's not even... It's not even psychosomatic. Mm -mm. Like, I just wake up and I'm fucked. Legit. So yeah. do you have backup pillows? Yeah, I have three of them. Oh, good. Do you carry one in your car? No, I don't okay. ever carry one in my car. Okay, fair. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to see like how deep the level of commitment was. It's you know? not that deep, but I do have a travel version mm -hmm. and I do obviously have one on my bed. Yes. Yeah. And I have one on, you know, my partner's bed. Yeah. But other than that, mm -mm. Okay, that's fair. I, I mean, have a backup. You, you do have a travel I version. I always have backup. Yeah. Of everything. That's perfect. Yeah. Then I would love to invite but you But I don't be... think I could <laughs> really get through my life without hot water either. That's probably up there. It's kind of a big I deal. love it like you. Yeah. It's really important. And it's funny because over the last two years, I've really gotten into Wim Hof and his breathing yeah. and his cold exposure. Yeah. Because I have fucking hated being cold, cold. my whole cold life. life. Right? But you get more resilient by doing you that. You do. Yeah. And there's a certain level and feeling of accomplishment knowing I can go into this hard thing, I can do this hard thing, and I can stay present throughout the entire experience without jettisoning my consciousness <laughs> to a nice warm tropical beach. So go figure. I mean, I love I love the hot water on so many levels. I also really appreciate the lessons that cold water has to teach, but I don't think that would necessarily help me come down after really stressful day necessarily no, no. and it's yeah. sometimes the only way i can get rid of the migraine is hot water mm -hmm. yeah bath or you know tea like how would i not have tea you Ooh. and i Ooh. yeah i know hot so, water mm -hmm. okay well so, yeah. i guess i picked a winner you did <laughs> okay so let's talk more about the cult mm. for a second you were raised okay. in a cult tell yeah. us more <laughs> <laughs> well fifth generation cult member Real proud, represent. Um, and most people know it as Seventh day Adventism, but there are flavors, right? And so, like ice cream? Oh, uh, yeah, girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like there's um, vanilla Seventh day Adventism, which is just generally pretty innocuous, mainstream Christianity. We still go out to eat on Saturdays. You know, we like fill up our car with gasoline. We can play basketball. We can do all of this kind of thing. Sometimes maybe we even go for a slow dance with our partner. Mm. But then there's the funky versions or the funky flavors which can pull you all the way to the David Koresh kind of Waco, Texas side of things. Okay. 
And I was probably, so th- what would that be? Would that be like Spumoni? Yeah, like lots of different stuff all mixed up in there with weird fruity candies and eh. And then I was probably a solid rainbow sherbet. That's right? my favorite. I love rainbow oh, sherbet. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. Rainbow sherbet. Cult. <laughs> yeah. I also love rainbows, as you know. <sighs> I do know that. Mm-hmm. So we had this really insular church group that all of my friends came from. We only hung out with Adventists, like, from this particular church group. We did not really associate with other Adventist churches. It was just, like, Gladstone Park, SDA Church, and the people that attended. And then it was stuff like, you know, we didn't eat meat. It was veg- Vegetarianism was sort of, like, the go-to distinguishing factor of Seventh-day Adventism, which their prophet, who is this woman who got hit in the head with a rock when she was a small girl and then started having these visions that she started writing down, and everybody started following what they said, is the one who founded the church. <laughs> <laughs> like, did anyone hear of epilepsy or traumatic brain injury? Or like, no, no. Because it was the 1840s, 50s that this church got started up with. So there was just so much happening back then. It was kind of like, well, we just discovered we could make ice cream. So let's make blueberry and let's make rainbow sherbet and let's make, you know, just like pick your... I had no idea that was mm-hmm. the beginning. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you grew up with no, no vegetarian. No dancing. No Vegetar- dancing. Vegetarian. No caffeine. Um, no, and very sort of like Orthodox Jewish in terms of Sabbath experience and observance, right? So we'd go from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. We weren't allowed to go to movie theaters. Friday to Saturday? Mm-hmm. Friday okay. sundown to Saturday sundown, just like. Um, so 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That was like holy day, holy time, very so much. So Saturdays, not Sundays. Mm-hmm. Not, oh, yeah, no. That was like a big point of contention. Okay. And, and pride was like. Why? We we worship on the right day. Oh, that's the right day. That's the right day. Sunday's the wrong day. Oh, like, really? Mm-hmm. Like all those Sunday churchgoers, straight to hell, straight <laughs> downtown. And it was something that they would hold Bible studies on and like seminars and try and get people converted to believe that Saturday was the right day and Sunday was the wrong day. And Catholics were like the antichrist so there was just this i could go into doctrinal weirdness all day and all night but the point is is that it created a very clear us versus them paradigm Uh uh-huh right Uh so you could be in the world but not of the world yes the lights just flickered and you also could be terrified just perpetually of mixing with the wrong people saying the wrong thing doing the wrong thing accidentally worse intentionally, and then ending up not going to heaven. So there is like this big sorting hat moment for Adventists at the end of time. P.S. Harry Potter is, woof, big time evil no-go. Um, <laughs> sorcery, <laughs> oh. sorcery, witches, okay. demons, you know. Okay. Um, so the sorting hat moment for Adventists is the end of, at the end of time. There's going to be a Sunday law that gets passed that says everyone has to worship on Sunday, and if they don't, then they can be killed. And so this is when all of the Adventists know to head for the hills, quite literally. <laughs> like We have to get out of town. We got to take our families and our kids, and we just got to let this play out because then Jesus is going to come back and take us, not them, up to heaven, and then magic will ensue. But that's not, the kicker. That's the kicker. That's, that's the kicker. That's how you know it's the end of the world. Yes, Sunday law. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I did not know this. Wow. Right here in the U.S. of A. <laughs> well, I just don't know that much about it. I mean, I was yeah. raised religious, but um, my version of it is different, right? Uh-huh. Because <sighs> while I was raised religious, no one really practiced it. Yes. They only just stuck me in religious school so that they could, you know, make sure that I turned out okay. Yeah. <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> so, kind of backfired. <laughs> uh, maybe in their opinion, because, yeah, they had put my um, two older sisters in public school. Ooh. And because they had put 
them in public school, Uh they thought, you know, that they had fucked them up, basically. And so they were trying a different story with me because I was five years younger. So it was more of a control thing than anything. Uh Yeah, because my sisters were really out of control. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But not you. So, well, I mean, I they were older than me. So yeah. when I looked at them, um, I figured out very quickly that mm-hmm. one, I mean, there's so many things I could say. But one, um, they were busy. They were very busy with the two of them. And yeah. I figured out quickly that if I... Didn't bring attention to myself, even though I got a lot of attention, but uh, just based upon the way I looked. But Mm -hmm. if I didn't bring a lot of attention to myself and if I hid and if I did all the right things, then I could seemingly be mostly invisible. And that was my role in the family. I tried as hard as I could to be invisible Hmm. and to do everything that I could because it made sense to me very early on that that was my only way of surviving in the abuse and that that was the only way to navigate it. Mm -hmm. So I just did everything that they wanted me to do and saluted. I never fought. Mm -hmm. I just was a doormat. I literally was in fawn my entire growing up experience because I was like, oh, no. I mean, if I just keep doing what (laughs) you need me to do, then I won't get hurt. Yeah. Of course. I will get hurt less. Gosh. I still got hurt, but I would not get hurt as much, right? And my sisters both fought, fought, fought. And so it just was very, very clear to me to just do what they wanted. <laughs> that was not the way. <laughs> that was not the way. <laughs> right. And so because, you know, I went to – first I went to um, – I went from public school to uh, private, you mm-hmm. know, a uh, Christian yeah. And so first I went to Christian school, and that was different because um, I had a really hard time integrating with the kids. Uh-huh. Um, How had, old were you when I you went integrated? From four, it was fourth to f- – I moved into fifth. Oh. So mm-hmm. fifth grade. And um, not only did I struggle uh, academically hmm. because they were all ahead of me, so I, I already was – upset that I had to do it, first of all. And then I studied all the summer previously with the teacher's manual to catch up. So I was super resentful about that. And I felt dumb. And then I had to do that teach, you know, the book, clear off the school year. And I'd already been through all the work. And I did that for the, for fifth and sixth grade. So Uh I felt like I was really dumb first. And socially, it was super awkward because it was so, so shy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my mom was working really hard to, for lack of a better word, beat that out of me. And so, yeah. so yeah, I used to sit at the lunch table alone a lot. And she used to, she told me this later, she used to come on her lunches and come watch me because she was so worried because I would just sit by myself. Wow. I had a really hard time. Wow. I did not do well in school. That sounds so formative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It right? definitely, um, yeah, it definitely changed who I was for mm-hmm. sure. And um, because she was not, you know, my mother was not happy with who I was. You know, she wanted me to be something other than mm-hmm. I was. Mm-hmm. I constantly you know, Critiquing you went and, on, you wanted, yeah. you went into stage and drama and theater and performance, but mm-hmm. I was at a very early age, put on stage consistently to um, have me overcome my shyness. Yeah. Wow. Talk about jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it must have been terrifying for you. It was terrifying. I cried a lot. Oh, Mm -hmm. gosh. Wow. How are we here? (laughs) (laughs) So I went to private school. And then in junior high, I also went to another private school. But we moved – well, we hadn't moved yet. We were thinking of moving. And so my parents pulled me out of that. Mm-hmm. And they stuck me into a much smaller environment um, that probably had like 10 or 12 kids in each grade, right? And um, I was there for junior high. Mm-hmm. And then in high school, my mom got the great idea that um, I should go to Catholic high school. A new Catholic high school was opening up in Orange County. A very famous one, and um, it was super famous now, but I was the charter class. And so um, my mom, I'll never forget, um, 
you know, joined a church so that okay. um, he could write a letter for me. And um, yeah, we didn't even know. He didn't even know the priest. He wrote a letter for me to get into um, into high school. Yep. So we did not practice. We did never went to church. It was all for show. Uh huh. And they just wanted me there because they wanted, um, yeah, they wanted the rules and the structure that came yeah. along with it. Yeah. They didn't want to have to, yeah, worry about me, worry about me. And Amazing. not that they ever had to worry about me. So no. that was what was so You're interesting. You're like, just everyone ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, what did you need me to do? Just yeah. tell me what you need me to do. Yeah. <sighs> so, yeah. So I went to Catholic school. And when I got there, they were like, you don't know anything. Ooh. Because everyone is a Christian, so uh -huh. your religion doesn't exist. This is the right way. Yes. Isn't that amazing? You and I had complete mirror Yes, experiences. that's what brought it up because that was exactly my experience Ugh. when I went to Catholic school. They were like, oh, no, you were a heathen before, yeah. and now we're going to teach you what religion is all Phew. about. Well, yeah. Lucky. Yes. The brothers <laughs> here know what's up. We're going to teach you what religion is. This is how we do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I was surrounded with a bunch of people who had helped build this. I mean, their parents, hmm. you know, donated the land and the gym and donated all these parts and pieces. And I was there totally with a bunch of rich people who were driving BMWs. And we couldn't afford any of that. We were just faking it. And so that was that was my experience of religion. So I was the kid in class that literally was like, I know people out there are thinking differently than this. Uh -huh. And so I was always challenging them. Mm -hmm. I challenged in school. I didn't challenge them. Challenged in school. So hmm. I was always like, excuse, excuse me. me. <laughs> how, how does that arc thing work? Explain uh -huh. that to me. And I got, you know, just have faith or, wow. you know, um, Faith. Finally, I, yeah, mm. finally I, you know, was told eventually, you know, just learn it for the test. But, yeah, my teacher got really mad at me, Mr. Giuliano. Thank I will you, Mr. Giuliano. <laughs> so that was kind of a segue, yeah, but that was my experience with the religion. And so it wasn't until probably, I think I took a world religions class in my junior year. They finally had electives, right? Uh -huh. And I took that and I started um, studying Carl Jung, and I was like, Ooh. oh, okay, and Buddhism, and What's I was up? like, okay, I knew other people out there. I mean, my mom keeps telling me that everybody thinks the same, but other people out there are thinking differently. I had this yes. feeling, and it just opened this whole other world. That's probably when I started, yeah, raising my hand for Mr. Giuliani and uh -huh. challenging him. But then I was like, okay, that's what I want to study. When I have the free, like when nobody's watching me because I was watched all the mm -hmm. time, I, that's there. That's I, as soon as I get away from college. So I probably um, planned college, like not kidding you. I was thinking about it like at 12, like how am I going to mm -hmm. get out of this house? Mm -hmm. Wow. I distinctly remember that. That's pretty motivated and pretty clear for well, being that I young. I was scared oh, shitless yeah. to leave. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, because I was told that I was incapable of ever succeeding on my own, mm -hmm. but and I was not given any tools to succeed on my own. Right. On purpose. Stay hopeless <laughs> and pretty. Yeah, please. Everything else will fall into place. <laughs> yeah. Some man is just gonna show yeah, up on a horse. Rescue and you. Rescue me. Yep. No. So um I went to college and that was my way out. Mm -hmm. And I, I that I barely I barely was capable of doing that in the sense that they warned me when I got there that it's possible that they might not be able to afford it or I might have to come back or whatever. And I was like, fuck that. Mm -hmm. no. uh -uh. I went to the co college that was the furthest that I could possibly get away and hear that. And um, the furthest that they would let me uh -huh. go. And then they would just show up occasionally and Ooh. Mm -hmm. pop in, pop in. Eight hours away, just pop in. <laughs> I would know. to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> I, would, I would know because my dad would whistle. What? Yeah, and we'd hear him in the courtyard, me and my roommate. We'd hear him in the courtyard of the apartment complex, and that's how I'd know my parents were in town. They wouldn't call and be, ah, boundaries. Oh, no such thing as boundaries. I wasn't allowed to have boundaries. I'll never forget my first day of college. Uh-huh. 
there were many things that happened my first day of college, but one specific memory. Go on. My mom had just helped me unpack uh-huh. and put the room together, the dorm room. She had found my roommate for me. She'd made friends at college orientation with someone's grandmother who had adopted this um, Layla. I'll never forget Layla. And Layla and I lived together that year. So she, my mom's unpacked me. She's, you know, organized my or- underwear drawer and put everything away and hung things and done all the things, right? And now they're leaving. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't given a car. I wasn't allowed to have one at college, of course. Me neither. And <laughs> uh, even though I had one at home, they yes, were like, no, you can't same. have it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, my God. They're like, no, you can't have it. Too so much. Um, I show up at college, and not kidding you, I'm sitting in a stoplight, and um, I think to myself, oh, my God, I'm free. And I turn to my roommate, who I don't even know yet, Layla, and I say, I just realized something. And she goes, what? My parents are sitting in the car. Like, we're both at the stoplight. Uh I'm watching them. We're about to turn left. Uh They're, like, going to go straight Uh or whatever. Uh And I'm like, we can wake up. I sounded like such a moron. We can wake up whenever we want to tomorrow. And she goes, yeah. And I go, (sighs) and we can go to bed whenever we want to tonight. She goes, yeah, like she thinks I'm like, <laughs> like who so are you? Weirdest person ever, <laughs> and I, like the realization, like I can dress however I want, I can do whatever I want. I'd never had that opportunity before. My mom made all wow the decisions for wow, me. Wow, Andrea, that's amazing. <laughs> College really was. Your second coming, so oh, to speak. It's like yeah. yeah, it is just so <clears throat> crazy from there on out, right? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I went from having so many boundaries uh-huh. to literally zero. None. None. Yeah. And this is something that they definitely talked about um, in the Adventist higher education system a lot because I went all the way from first grade through my first college degree in the Adventist school system. They wanted to make a cradle-to-grave experience, right? <laughs> you just never had to leave. It was so great. Disneyland all the time. And <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, there was one year. I went to Portland State, um, lost a bet with my mother, ended up back in Adventist University, and had selected the place that was the farthest away from her that I could get as well. And so I was in England, and they actually had dorms where you had one floor of men and one floor of women. But in the States, it was always like, the boys are on this side of the 700-acre campus, and the girls are on that side of the 700-acre campus. Because you're coming from boarding schools or you're coming from academies or whatever. And if you take the guardrails or bumpers off, they're going to go completely Completely nuts. nuts. Yep. Yep. And it was just really interesting because, of course, in England, you know, there were a lot fewer bumpers like that. So we could fraternize with each other. And no one ended up pregnant and no one ended up, you know, overdosing on drugs and nobody ended up. It was fine. Like, yeah, yeah we went out and we got drunk at the pub yeah, yeah. fairly regularly, but yeah. it was right down the street and we helped each other get back and it was okay. And so, yeah, just that <clears throat> that question of what do boundaries actually do for us, you know, and like what do healthy boundaries look like when we have them in place? They give us the ability to to not go completely nuts, right? But also the ability to explore and test and see who we are outside of the purview of <laughs> our adults, our society, our religions, our whatever. Our parents. Our parents, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, And what yeah. are they like for us, right? Yeah. Is a whole discovery process, especially if that hasn't been modeled or yeah. shown to you, right? Because mm-hmm. that wasn't my college experience. No, no. <laughs> no. My college experience is a little different than yours, although I didn't end up getting – oh, I did end up getting pregnant. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Not in college. Uh, yeah, you did. So. I did, and <laughs> you know? I also ended up drunk on the floor quite often because mm-hmm. I didn't. I yeah, I yes. was just trying to erase what was going on internally. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And there's a difference between doing experimentation to try and numb out 
versus experimenting to try and find your own boundaries. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just remember meeting some kids like that in um, at Portland State the one year that I was there and being so fascinated. Like, what must it feel like to try something because you're curious, not because you're angry at being so controlled or you're terrified that you might die before you really live or, 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 you know, having all of these other drivers and emotional subconscious pushers moving you in that direction. How liberating I thought it must feel to just be like, hey, I wonder what would happen if I drove my car 70 miles an hour down a 35 mile an hour street. You never made those choices. <clears throat> I never made those choices from a place of uh, genuine curiosity and a sense of being really seated and rooted in myself. I always did them from a place of I could be dead at any moment, you know, having this early childhood That's experience, right. just brushing up with death, like, yeah, constantly during the ages of eight to 12. And being like, well, I just have to live as much as I can as quickly as I can, because tomorrow may never come. And so I would say like fear of my own mortality and of missing out on things gave me the bravery or the chutzpah to actually go out and try a lot of these things that I wouldn't normally have done because I do have a personality just naturally that wants to follow the rules, wants to know what those boundaries are and wants to like do them. Hmm. So I, I like to work and I, I like to be good at things and I like to apply myself, you know, and so without that experience of, of really brushing up with my mortality at such a young age, I doubt that I would have ever had the motivation or the fuel to pop out of that Capricornian, you know, self that just wants to achieve and be respectable and, you know, yeah. And be contained. And be contained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but that's definitely a paradox of you, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You tell me, Andrea. <laughs> well, only because there's a lot of freedom with you, too. Mm. You love being free. I do, but it's and, also and terrifying. You love, <laughs> you love pushing up against something for your freedom, too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's such a key part of it, though, that also I think is important, you know, in considering things like loving everything. <laughs> <laughs> such a big concept, like everything, to really love everything. Um, my name, Jamie. Yes. Right? I mean, it's it's the French word for I love, yes. j'aime. And I don't think my mother knew that when she chose to spell my name that way. She meant to name me after my father, but she really gave me my marching orders with that name because love is the freedom to explore so many things and to ask so many questions and still have some sort of framework and boundary, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, knowing that I do have this extremely curious nature, absolutely, and also, like, I do want to be contained. I do want to know what my boundaries are, and I do want to have an operating system that I am running from, not running, you know, running off of, not running away from, but, you know, like, <laughs> I want my marching orders. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, love is like, I remember actually the one, one of the many things, but one in particular growing up um, in high school, I did a lot of athletics. And one of the things that I did was cross country running which was weird because I wasn't supposed to be able to do that with the heart condition, but I was like, fuck you, I do what I want, right? And I know that... you now I can't see you running. R really? I run. Do you? I do. Okay. Sometimes. I haven't, like, recently, but, um, but you can't see me running. <laughs> I used to love to run, Andrea. I used to be, like, really fast, and I could run forever before the cancer, and then afterwards, it slowed me down, right? So it was one of those things where I was like, I have to prove I can still do this. So I'm going to be on the cross-country team. So I'd run every day. And I'd run up and down the roads by my house. And I remember reciting this um, Bible chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter, right? Like, love is patient. Love is kind. It's the most important thing, pa to paraphrase. And I would memorize it. And it just became like this mantra. And... I still come back to that today when I'm like, who am I? What am I doing? What is my work here on this planet? It's like, oh, here's the boundaries, 
right? Like this is what love is. This is one way to think about it. This is both freedom and containment simultaneously. So so you still come back to the Bible verses. For sure. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I took a hiatus for a good 20 years, but that always would creep in anytime I was having some sort of life crisis or existential question. It was like, oh, yeah, love is patient. Love is kind. It's like. I was just laughing the other day because I was like, my brain is full of so many things that are useless. For instance, John 14, too. How is that what is, helping me? What's now? that? <laughs> that was the life verse that we had to choose, right? Oh. We had to choose a life verse, and so you memorize it. For mm. your life? Like your life guidance verse? I guess. Oh, so can I hear it, please? <laughs> <laughs> In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Interesting. That gave me chills. Why? Why did you choose that one? Because I wanted security that I could go Home. somewhere. <gasps> oh, chills, chills. So many chills. I had nowhere oh, honey. to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is... Yeah, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> you're, I, I'm about ready to cry. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so beautiful. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> And as soon as you started saying that, I of, I know that Bible verse, too. And I always thought about it as being, um, like, I got you. Like, I got a place for you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that safety piece and mm -hmm. the security piece, like, that is so me. You. <laughs> Yes. It totally is. Like, that's what you pulled from that was uh -huh. this is a safe place. Yeah, that's the only thing. I mean, I remember a lot of Bible yeah. verses, but yeah, that's – That was your that life was my one. Mm -hmm. Oh. I think that's the first time I've ever oh. actually explained oh. why. And I don't think I knew at the time. No. Mm -mm. It just felt right. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Wow. Mm -hmm. We'll get ready for an embroidered pillow for your birthday. <laughs> Give me one, I'll die. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, we've gotten through two of my three million questions. It's good to have a guide. Um, okay. <laughs> so how about uh, we've talked a little bit about what it's like to grow up in your family. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do yeah. you want to tell me more about what it was like to grow up in your yeah. family? I'm the Besides oldest. the cult? Yeah, the cult. I, I'm the oldest of three girls. And so I – um, was wanted. I knew that from a very young age. My mom really wanted to have kids, and she had been married once before she met my dad. Um, and when she had me, it was like I was her miracle child because she thought she was too old at 26 to, <laughs> to start a family. Oh, the 1970s. And, um, and so I knew I was wanted. And I was also just incredibly precocious growing up in, in the family. My mom was a teacher, so she would just teach me all these things. So my role in the family was to be the smart one and to be the regurgitator and to really, like, depend on my mind to master a situation and be present with whatever challenges happen to arise. Um, my sister Jackie, the middle child, Jackie um, – <laughs> I mean, just look at my face. <laughs> She's so lovely. She's just pure, pure love. I mean, this kid was sweet, adorable, um, mischievous. She's a Gemini, but it was all, always undercover. So it was kind of like she'd pinch me and then I'd be like, Jackie, and then I'd get in trouble because I was the one causing all the ruckus, right? Big, big mouth, sneaky little pinchy, cute fingers. So, so kind, so loving. And then Summer... My youngest sister came along seven years after I was born. So she was like baby, baby, Leo, super bright in terms of like sparkly, right? I mean, she was just like the center of attention. Everybody loved her. She was the one that could remember jokes. We laughingly called her the Uber Mathis for most of her young life, Jackie and I, because we were like, God, you're like five foot ten. You look like fucking Galadriel. Is there anything that you can't or won't do to gain love and approval? And she was always the one that was sort of two-faced, right? There was like the popular summer and then there was the more private summer, which hmm. you never really got to see behind 
the public summer unless you got lucky, right? And she was really close with my sister Jackie because Jackie was five when I got cancer or six. Summer was just a baby. She was like a year old. So Jackie kind of became her surrogate mother yeah. because my mom was with me in the hospital all the time. My dad was a workaholic. And, um, and so they had each other. And so the dynamics were was I was the troublemaker, <clears throat> but also the miracle. So they couldn't really kick me to the curb because I was smart and I was saved for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But, but the black sheep and the one that caused all the trouble in the family, that's always what I was told. It was like, you just made our lives a living hell was one of these things that my mom would tell me on the regular. And why can't you be more like your sister? And so that was the messaging I got. Jackie got the messaging of like, just shut up and be quiet. <laughs> I've got to attend to your sister. She's sick now or whatever. So Jackie was very much the invisible one. And okay. then Summer was the adored one. And and meanwhile, you know, the dynamic between my parents was very contentious. Like they fought a lot um, and loudly, right? So they were almost Italian in terms of their level of emotional expression. In fact, this was one of my earliest memories was getting woken up probably at like age two or three, hearing them fighting downstairs and like crawling out into the hallway and like looking down and kind of catching their shadows as they were arguing and yelling in the kitchen. Were you ever afraid of it? Yeah. Okay. I remember being scared. Okay. And sad. You and know, were like, you worried that something bad was going to happen between them, like they would break up or? No, I just remember being scared by the volatility. You know, like the loud sounds and the banging and crashing. They never hit each other, to my knowledge, but they did with their words and with their volume. You and, know what I mean? And did you ever fear growing up that they were going to leave each other? I wished that they would. Because I, of the fighting? Yes. And because my father was cruel. He was just an emotionally um, a abusive man when he would get really upset and still is, you know, I mean, he's, he also has this very Jekyll Hydean personality. Uh -huh. He's a Leo or I'm sorry, a Libra Scorpio cusp actually. So it's like on the one hand, he's super balanced, super charismatic, super diplomatic. Everyone's like, Oh God, you're so Christ-like. Wow, Jim, you're wonderful. And then there's the home version where he's just like running my mom down and he's just angry and you know i mean it's really scary yeah because he came from a non-culty background so he had like all of this language at his disposal mouth like a sailor father's mouth was like a sailor when he was in his good place dad very circumspect when he was triggered stay back so i have a, a mouth like a sailor now too i mean it's really interesting the things that we choose to pattern pattern Exactly. And so growing up in my house felt scary. It felt scary, but it felt stable because I knew they weren't going to leave each other. My mom was really committed to not leaving unless there was a biblical reason to leave, which means infidelity. Yeah. <laughs> and there was no way my dad was going to step out on her because he was building an empire. And that was really the thing that he cared about was being able to be financially wealthy and stable and so he worked like a dog and we never saw him so he was absentee volatile charismatic and abusive so my patterning was like hey you don't get to have needs um, unless they support dad's um, career ambitions right and fall into the family plan for finances but that should probably mean that you get yourself trained to be a good wife and or worker if you don't get married so that you can stand on your own two feet financially, but probably don't that do that because you should just get married instead and and don't really know who you are because I don't want to I don't want to hear that shit. Right. So And also the modeling of relationships are volatile. Yeah. Yeah. And that men aren't able to emotionally regulate mm -hmm. their anger. Mm -hmm. And that you stay. And that you stay through you it. You stay. You stay through it. Yep. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, we both got that lesson. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay. What people have come into your life to teach you how to love? Ooh. 
These are good questions, Andrea. Well, the first person that comes to mind in high school was my Bible teacher. And he was this really, really tall guy with long hippie hair, and he was a musician, and he was super creative, and he just kind of rode in like a cowboy off of the, <laughs> the range one day and led this worship service with, like, drums and guitars, and I love music. I mean, that probably is one of the things that I am here to, to do. do. And um, he was someone who just saw me. I mean... <laughs> By the time I was in high school, I definitely had a chip on my shoulder and was like, no one can tell me what to do, but I'm also going to excel at everything so nobody can tell me what to do. And so I would do stuff like breaking out of off of campus without lunch passes, you know, to drive around Portland with my shirt off with my girlfriends and just like flash everyone and be like, fuck you. Um, and so, <laughs> I did not so, know that about oh, you, but it's so you. Right? Uh -huh. um, within the first week of him being at school, um, he was on duty to guard the gate right? And check the lunch passes to make sure everybody leaving for lunch was sanctioned. And um, I didn't have one. I had two of my girlfriends in the car. I was like, let's do this. This is the new guy. He doesn't fucking know. And so we blew right up there. He nicely was going to say hi or whatever. And I just drove right past him. I was just like, or whatever, just blew right past and expected him to maybe chase me or expected him to something, report me. I don't know. But I came back and after lunch and he he tracked me down um, and he was just like, hey, <laughs> he could he was twinkling, you know, I mean, he was obviously like less concerned with the fact that I'd broken out of school and more curious about why I had done it. I didn't get into trouble. God bless him. And we became great friends. And he took me aside one, da one day, my senior year of high school, and I was having a hard time over something. And he said, you know, Jamie, there are, there are trees that grow on the sides of mountains. And they're buffeted by the winds, and they're shaped by the rains. And their oh, roots trees. grow into the rock, mm -hmm. and they draw their nutrients from the rock and the elements. And they're twisted and gnarled and beautiful. He's like, that's you. And Those are my favorite trees on the Oregon coast. Right? They have character. They've suffered. They've struggled. They've held on. Right? They're amazing They're to amazing. Me. They're <clears throat> amazing to me. They're amazing. And so he's somebody that really taught me how to love because I think that he showed me that it doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to be flawless. It can be messy. It can be creative. It can be un completely unformed and unfinished and still have worth and value. And how old were you when you learned this from him? Like 17. So what was your earliest memory of love when you were a child? Ooh, Ooh. Well, what I would consider love now is much different than what I was told love was then. So I have to click back through and think, like, what was actually, oh, oh, okay. My best friend living in West Lynn was this girl named Jessica Caldwell. And Jessica Caldwell would come over and we would sing Annie songs at the top of our lungs and brush our hair out long and wear dresses and twirl. And she was amazing. Sounds like. <laughs> and she had, and you know, I was like four or five. I remember this very clearly. Mm -hmm. She had this stuffed animal that I don't even know what it was. It was some sort of like bulbous winged creature that I was obsessed with named Amaryllis. And she would let me hold Amaryllis when I'd come over to her house and we'd play in her bedroom. And I just loved Amaryllis. I can still remember what Amaryllis looks like, felt like, smelled like. And for my birthday that year, she gave me Amaryllis. And it was the simplest thing in the sea of toys. And I absolutely loved it because she knew how much I loved it. And she it, gave it, and to, she you gave anyway. it to me. And she gave it to me. Yeah, at that age, like, who does that? 
And so, someone who was raised in a different family than you and I. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And so So that you don't. So I am interrupting you, but you your earliest memory isn't actually with someone in your family. Nope. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of sad. I mean, I have lots of early memories of my family, but most of them. Yeah. Involve me being held down in some way and having things done to me that I didn't really appreciate. And um I guess the one thing that might qualify for that is that my mom did love to teach me things and she would take me into the shower with her and she would teach me the months of the year and she would stamp them out with her feet. January, February, March, April, May, June. And we'd just go through the months of the year and it was rhythmic and it was warm and we were close and I was good at it and it was fun and we were together and it was like that was just a simple thing. Hmm. So that would probably qualify in my mm -hmm. definition now of okay. what love is too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you alluded to being held down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. doing a lot of things that you didn't want to do. And that leads me to my next question. Um, what people have come into your life to teach you how not to live? <laughs> yeah. Well, my father definitely came into my life to teach me that lesson. And weirdly also, you know, what one of my greatest medicines is, which is being out doors um, and the healing power of nature because he was an avid outdoorsman and took me out very young, you know, and would force march us <laughs> in heavy backpacks around um, the great outdoors, which, ooh, but also a real sense of being able to do hard and beautiful things and to be able to see something through to completion in wild spaces, which... Mm. Phew, like, I will always be grateful to him for that. But in terms of how not to love, I mean, he's a rageaholic. And he completely would lose control of his impulses. And, you know, one of my earliest memories of him was being um, pulled out of my crib at, like, age two or three again from a dead sleep and be, and having him yell, I remember him yelling, and then like taking me to the bathroom, turning on the light, turning on the cold water, and holding me under the cold shower. Because he was upset with you. Because he was furious. Because come to find out, <laughs> I had taken off my diaper, right, and thrown it on the floor, and he had come in barefoot in the night and stepped in it. And I didn't put that together at that time, obviously, you know, being that young, just remember being terrified and that's where that early programming of you're not allowed to speak your needs or you will be not only terrorized but punished for speaking your needs because daddy is the king and you perform and you shut the fuck up and you let him do what he wants and keep your head down right and you stay and you st fucking stay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and so you know, that and then the fact that he was gone all the time and never really – I never saw him really being tender or kind with my mother. Never saw him really taking a leadership role in the home spiritually or um, emotionally. He let my boyfriend when I was 14 years old live with us that summer and gave him complete unrestricted access to me. Never protected me, like, with boys at all. And never gave me the talk of, like, if anyone ever tries anything with you, like, I will fucking take him out. Never. It was just, like, I'm here. I'm not here, but when I am here, I'm unpredictable at best, mm. you know. And so I would say he was one of my biggest teachers of how not to love my mom is more complicated because she was the one that was there, mm -hmm. right, with us raising three children within seven years of each other, you mm -hmm. know. And and she she does have a very loving, pure heart. She's a Virgo, so she really, like, has this internal s moral structure that she tries to live by. But with that is also the, the dark side of Virgo, which is that extreme, like, legalistic, very judgmental, very compartmentalized. Very structured. Very, very structured. Very organized. 
Yeah, but not organized um, in environment, but very organized in terms of values. Yeah. (laughs) This goes here. It doesn't go there. And so a lot of her love, um, I knew she would always be there for me. I could always call her. She would, I could, I could still go back at this point in time and be like, mommy. (laughs) Ah." And she'd be like, okay, but you need to do this, this, and this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. Always conditional. Yes. Unconditionally conditional. And so um, for for her, uh, that nitpicking kind of like, you're not okay as you are. Uh, you need to be 120 pounds. You need to put mascara on your eyelashes. You need to wear this kind of clothing, go to this school. You need to show up and be a representative of the family, put on the pretty face, stay, mm-hmm. come, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so um, – that that was another good teacher of <laughs> what not to do too, and you know, I mean, those those are the big ones. Those are the formative ones. Um, and so, would you say that you didn't learn unconditional love until you were a teenager? Probably, mm-hmm. probably. I mean, really, no strings attached. Like, I see you. I love you. You're worth it because you are. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, yeah. Which is and just, mine was a teacher too. Really? Yeah. Thank God for teachers. You I know. know. I mean, I was in college. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. I was home from college, and I went to um, the junior college mm-hmm. to take a class, and I was teaching or taking a pottery class. And my English teacher from high school was in the pottery class with me, taking it as well. <laughs> And she and I were having a conversation about how difficult it was to be at home with my mother again because I'd been away at school. And I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, Andrea, have you ever heard the term unconditional love? And I said, no. (laughs) And she said, well, it sounds to me like your mom's love is very conditional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. It still blows my mind being a parent now myself of a nine-year-old how how love can be conditional like is it really love if it's conditional it's a really good question right right <laughs> cuz i'm like well i know there are definitely times it's loving i mean ish is it <sighs> the intention maybe to be loving mhm because like i think your mom had intentions to be loving yes, in yes. her criticism she thought uh-huh. she was doing you a favor yes. or benefit uh-huh. as did mine yeah yeah she thought she was being loving mm-hmm. but i think it's really hard to to know what love is if you're not taught what love is too if it wasn't instructed to you as a child right when i yeah. look at my mother's relationship with her mother Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that modeling is so critical, right? And there's the intellectual knowledge of what love is, like going back to that Bible verse that I memorized, where it's like really close, but not quite. It's taking the theory and turning it into practice, where the loving actions don't necessarily model to us what love is is but they point us in that direction Mm -hmm. right so though i couldn't have said oh yes i experienced unconditional love from my parents i could say oh but this passage tells me it's this 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 and this and that doesn't really stack up with what i've experienced so where can i find that that? Mm -hmm. okay so you were on a search for that did you find it Mm -hmm. i've been finding bits and pieces of it like a breadcrumb trail do you know what i mean and all of them seem to be leading me back to myself which is so interesting because it's uh (laughs) I had a teacher in university who was my poetry teacher basically say um you know words or poetry good poetry points us at something that it can never quite give us the experience of but it it gives us the direction to look or Mm -hmm. to sniff around in, Mm -hmm. right? And so I feel like I've had a lot of those experiences in relationship while at the same time unconsciously repeating some of this patterning that I learned from what love is not in my early childhood. 
And so now, for example, you know, I'm in this huge confluence moment and intersection in my life where it's Mm -hmm. like the marriage is of 10 years is going out the door. The lover has gone out the door, you know, like a pregnancy has gone out the door. Everything's being stripped away. All these things that I thought love was that have, again, forced me to take an abrupt about face and be like, okay, Jamie, how about you? What do you how are you going to treat yourself in this situation? Because this is untrod territory. You know, you have never, I have never fully experienced unconditional love from me to me because I have not necessarily had it modeled to me in a complete relationship up to this point in my life. And I'm 43. So it's a little sobering sometimes to just look around and realize, wow. <laughs> You can have this deep desire, this dream. You can be named the thing that you desire more than anything in the world. And sometimes it takes, it just takes time to continue to choose that exploration and that journey of going towards the heart of you to really discover the realization of that dream or what love really is. Well, I think also it's the only way to, it, it's the only way through to actually be in a loving relationship because mm-hmm. other people treat you the same way that you treat yourself. Mm-hmm. So if you're constantly abandoning yourself in an attempt to get mm-hmm. love mm-hmm. because that was modeled for you and I, yeah, then, you know, other people are going to abandon you mm-hmm. when it comes to love. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think through my own journey, learning self-love, like self-love was never modeled to me. That was selfish, right? Right. right. So (laughs) how dare you love yourself? You need Mm -hmm. to put everybody else first. So in that journey of learning how to love myself more, I've, what I've recognized is at this point in, in my life, at least that, it teaches me great discernment when mm. I can see that other people aren't loving me the same way mm-hmm. that I would love myself. Mm-hmm. And that's been new for me, too. I'm older than you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's been pretty recent as well. Yeah. And cultivating that on a regular basis. Um Modeling that for other people, right? Showing up for yourself in ways that other people haven't been able to show up for you in the past or that you've chosen people who haven't shown up for you in the past, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And thinking that that was love. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So many things to sort through in the hunt to find (laughs) what love really is. Mm -hmm. Well, it's within you. But Mm -hmm. isn't it funny that we were both raised religious and somehow that (laughs) message (laughs) missed us both? Well, it's like the message was there. God is love. But the the modeling of that was sadly absent. Yeah. Right? And it's just, again, so interesting – Um, thinking about what is it that breaks us open um, or unveils the love within us to ourselves. Maybe it's another way of putting it because it feels like, you know, we're taught to chase the experiences that feel good because those are good emotions, feeling satisfied, happy, successful, accomplished, you know. Um, But it's usually Mm -hmm. (laughs) the other emotions or the other experiences like loss and like pain and abandonment, betrayal, rejection, that are the ones that actually open us to be able to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really have that experience Mm -hmm. of what love is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or recognizing that we had love. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, I was just listening to Pema Chodron this morning talk about the three ways that we can get unstuck. And one of them was taking whatever's happening in the moment and treating it as universal wisdom. So literally, if somebody's criticizing you and telling you that you're bad and you're awful and you're whatever, taking that and being like, okay, 
That's wisdom. What is that showing me about where I'm stuck or like where I'm still holding on to these areas of self-belief? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Where do I think that I'm bad? Yeah. Where do I? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. And, uh, and, and everything and every moment is medicine. If we choose, choose to, to listen see it and or choose see to it. listen mm-hmm. and, and to, yeah. I mean, see it really for me is like so key in that because we just spend so much, I will speak personally, spent so much time, um, not intentionally, but subconsciously not looking at these areas where I felt guilt or shame or lack of self-worth or not deserving of love or whatever that um, self-abandoning behavior happened to be that now that everything that I have feared and loathed and not looked at subconsciously is coming up full force, full face to me, I see, oh, wow, this is where, <laughs> this is where this comes from. Um, this is how I don't value myself. This is how I don't take care of myself. Can I actually show up in this moment? Just this one. Forget 10 years from now, right now. Can I stay with myself and just see that and let there be spaciousness enough to not judge myself or to reinforce that cycle of self-loathing or self-abandonment or whatever it happens to be. Can I love myself more in this moment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or can I sprinkle in love where somebody else was not emotionally regulated themselves or completely consumed with their own Mm -hmm. stuff and couldn't show it to me Yes, at an earlier age. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or even in my present relationships, you know, I mean, especially, right, because we have these stories that we tell ourselves um, about what happened to us when we were children mm-hmm. that changes over time. Mm. And so it's like, really, <laughs> what I have is what's happening right now. And this is where I can really apply that sprinkling if need be, um, because this is this is my classroom right now in this moment Um, because that feels like such a big hook too in terms of being able to recover heal move forward from some of these arguably and like real traumatic events that happen to us isolated incidences or chronic conditions that we we live through Um, but to actually transform that into something that is generative and is beautiful and allows us to step more fully into relationship with ourselves you know, and grow the life that we have always longed for and dream is possible, regardless of what anyone else outside of us is doing or saying to us. Hmm. Is that where you feel like you are right now? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because sometimes, as you know, life just comes so hard and fast. You can't do anything, but just take the next step. You can't project five years or even into next week what you're going to do or how you're going to feel or what's going to be coming down the pike. So yeah, the present moment very much feels like where I'm living these days. <laughs> like a, a sort of forced enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, sometimes you can't even take a step. Sometimes you're just surveying the damage. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're and like breathing. Where do I go? Exactly. Where do I go next? Yep. Uh-huh. So true. Yeah, you're definitely at a crossroads in your life. <laughs> um, what makes you feel loved, Jamie? What makes me feel loved is quality time spent with externally, you know, with friends. That makes me feel really loved. Um, when I give myself permission to do things uh, that are interesting, beautiful, um, like I don't know, going on an adventure that makes me feel really loved when I give myself permission to just explore. Permission. Yeah, permission. That's a a nice synopsis. Permission Mm -hmm. makes me feel loved. Um, And consent makes me feel loved as well. Mm -hmm. And I can say to myself, just for example, like, is this okay if I take another step towards this action? And my body says, yes. Or it says, no. no. <laughs> you know, I mean, like that. Is, and listening. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Being in that exchange, right? Mm-hmm. In that conversation and that relationship, right? Because it's interesting and that makes me feel loved being interested and having my the curiosity. Mind and, yeah, just that. It just feels so good. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So, how do you. 
How have you learned to love yourself more? Oh, I'm on a steep learning curve for that right now. Mm. And I would say uh, giving myself space is one of the biggest things that I have done and I'm learning to do to love myself because I have spent so much of my life externalizing my value and asking for validation, care, investment, direction from other people Mm -hmm. that it can be very difficult for me to know what my true feeling is in any given moment or like what the right action is for me in a situation or um, a scenario and giving myself space is so critical to being able to just like, okay, there's no rush. (laughs) You have all the time you need to listen, to relax, to regenerate. And it's also one of the things that I fear, that I feared the most, is that... Is space. Oh, yeah. That distance, being alone. Okay. So earlier we were talking before the podcast about mm. being more in your femininity versus your masculinity. Mm-hmm. Would you say that the, that is also connected to the spaciousness? Do you feel like... I mean, I know that's a whole other conversation, mm. but do you feel like <clears throat> sitting more in your... I know it's a term that's being thrown around right now, divine feminine, but uh-huh. in more of your femininity gives you that space, spaciousness because we had talked, you know, earlier about when women are really in their masculinity, right, mm. and trying to control their situation and or environment. I think it's because I come from a background of trauma and that's just how I learned how to take control of my environment. But yeah. – um, you were saying your <sighs> own version of that, which is yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember? Um, wanting to receive, you know, just putting myself on the back burner so that I could actually get that witnessing, security, love, stability, and have it show up for you rather than you for me. forcing it to happen mm-hmm. with somebody. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And to your point, yes, the spaciousness. I feel like is directly tied to receptivity, yes. which feels like the essence of divine femininity. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, because that's that's what we do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we receive, and then we germinate, and then we generate, and um, we bring things to life from that space of receptivity. And that takes that takes space, and that takes time. Do you think you shied away from that because your mother was more submissive, for lack of a better word, and so it kind of took you on this Hmm. path of feeling like you needed to be more assertive? Yeah, that's so interesting. I remember my dad, and he he does not remember this. In fact, he's called me some horrible names when I've reminded him of this in conversation. Um, My mother would tattle on me. Mm-hmm. If we got into an altercation yep. to my dad and then sick him on me, basically. Yep, that happened in our family, too. Yeah, and so I remember one day he came. I heard him come home. I heard her telling him what had happened, her version, and him coming up the stairs, blasting my door open, and I was waiting for him. And um, he was like, what is this your mother told me? about?" Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, that's her version, you know, not mine. And he, like, open hand slapped me across the face. And in that moment, I felt the steel inside me just, fuck you, you know? And that was that warrior, that masculine, just like, no, hard. I am not receiving that. I am taking you on and I will take you down. And I just pinned him to the wall behind him with my eyes and was just like, hit me again. Come on. And he just white as a sheet, walked away, right? And so, yes, to your point, there there was something in me always that felt the safest or the most familiar, comfortable when I had something to push against because it was not safe to be receptive because you'd just end up with a lap full of shit. And so now um, 
I'm like, no, I actually, like, I like it when people care for me. I love being able to receive their words of praise or their um, financial gifts or whatever it happens to be, their respect, admiration, care. Um, or even their boundary. Or even their, oh, boundaries. Wow, what a what a revelation. You know, how sexy are those? And when how someone good. knows what they want. Oh, yeah. It's or like, tells you. For sure. Mm-hmm. You want to see me on Tuesday? I'll wait until Tuesday and I'll just get about my business because I know on Tuesday mm-hmm. I'll receive you, mm-hmm. you know, and and boundaries are, they're really wonderful things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I'm in that process of just letting myself have, give myself permission to receive spaciousness, um, the gift of spaciousness from me to me so that I can then receive the abundance from life. How do you love all of the things that have happened? <sighs> it's a process because there are many things that I have swirled the drain around, you know, that have been very big and conscious experiences. As I've, as I've swirled the drain and I've started to see them from different perspectives, like the cancer experience my worst nightmare came true. Like, how could this be a good thing? How could this loving God I was raised and inculcated to believe in give me my nightmare and then expect me to be like Johnny on the spot to serve him with the rest of my life? And (laughs) I got to a place where I realized, you know, this, this experience showed me how powerful I really am. This experience showed me and asked me, called out of me, this bravery and this courage that I did not know was possible and has moved me in a direction of knowing in my bones I can do hard and beautiful things, right? And um, and my will is really strong. My <laughs> can, will is really it's strong. It's really strong, um, which, you know, has uh, two sides to it. And, and so it's just, it's time, right? Like time is what has given me the ability to circle some of these moments and poke them and prod them and like have the space to be able to retreat and like center, come back around, look at it from this side, feel into it this way. And I'm so grateful for that because for all intents and purposes, you know, I should have been dead years ago and and I'm here still getting to chew on the gifts of these initiations. Hmm. And that's really kind of how I've reframed the story for a lot of these things. (laughs) It's like, it, they're they initiations. initiations. Yeah, like I'm a medicine woman. I'm here to be a being of light. Like I am love, gem. I love, like that is who you are, who I am. So even when I'm going through heartbreak, even when I'm going through loss or grief or whatever, like love is big enough to hold that. Again, Capricornian, you know, like, hold me, baby. Um, And so they're initiations. They're all part of this training or this remembering that is leading me deeper into my purpose and mission for being in a human body as Jamie in this life. Do you think that in loving yourself more, it gives you more space to forgive what Mm. has happened? Mm. Forgiveness is such an interesting word because I think I'm going to go out on a limb here that maybe both of us were taught that forgiveness was kind of like permission to perpetrate again, given Uh to the person that hurt you. For sure. Mm -hmm. And I remember it blowing my mind when I had a meditation teacher say, forgiveness is not for the other person. It's for you. It's for you. It's where you take the hook of that suffering or that pain or that, you know. Yeah meanness out of you and release it back to life to turn it into something generative like it's for you that's freedom yeah i bless you be free so i hope so you know i uh, it's hard for me to forgive i have to own that because i i am such a sensual being, actually, despite like this brain that was supposed to take me to the moon and back, like I am a very embodied person. And when there has been embodied trauma, 
my body remembers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've spent a lot of time like learning the language of my body, uh-huh. how it shows up, that how it feels, like the illnesses are like the imbalances and what uh-huh. do those mean, right? And so I I will just say, I hope so. Um, softening, like I want, my prayer is um, soften my heart so that I can be free. Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great Bible verse. It's not a Bible verse. I know. But it should be. It should be. It's yeah. our verse. Yeah. Well, let's just get started on that project, too. <laughs> the Bible according to Andrea Love and Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we need to write our own. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Ooh, there's so many questions. <sighs> Oh, this was one I wanted to talk to you about. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. How do we come to a place of acceptance that not every person we feel something deep for and moving with is meant to make a home with us or meant to be with us forever? Ooh. Let me sit with that for just a second because that makes me think of my marriage and maybe yours as well, which you could speak to. And... um, that's why I put it down. You know, we're it's both. It's perfect for us. It's perfect for us. Yeah. yeah. You're a few um, steps further down the road than I am, but I am in the beginning stages of divorce and letting that relationship go. And one of the things that has been so difficult for me, as we spoke about earlier before we started filming, was um, how do we let go of dreams of things that never were. Yes. I'm glad you're bringing it back to this. Oh, man. Because my acupuncturist wisely said the other day when I was lamenting the fact that my husband seems to be totally over this relationship and I'm having all of these feelings of grief and all of these feelings of loss and just like, oh, God, maybe we can make it work. Is there a way we can circle back around? She's like, Jamie, they're not grieving the relationship. The relationship was never there. From everything you've described, you know, there was a moment very early in the relationship where it was like, ah, fire the karma. Here we are. We're here to do this thing, to have this child. Um, And then it was like, peace out. And so you're grieving the thing, the dream that never was. There was never a point in this relationship where you truly felt connected, you truly felt seen, you truly felt, you know, like in relationship with this person. And so what are you grieving? And oh, my, 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 that was hard to hear and super prescient because it just told me it is okay. And I have known this for a while. It is okay for relationships that you have pinned dreams to, to not be the fulfillment of that dream and to allow those things to to move on down the stream of your life and to bless them instead of getting hooked by them again. You know, like it's okay to forgive yourself, (laughs) to forgive the dream that never was and the part that that person played in showing you that this is not the dream right? That you actually, Jamie, need to have that dream come true with you first, and then (laughs) see what happens in your external reality. And so um, I'm kind of in this place right now where I'm really, and have always, but like, especially in an embodied way now, wanting to take responsibility for the emotions that I am having that this relationship ending has really brought to the surface instead of projecting those onto my still husband, soon to be not, um, you know, and, and blessing him and letting him go in peace rather than with acrimony or with, again, that projection of my own grief over the dream that never was that goes all the way back to childhood <laughs> and that original programming. So um, what about if you've been loved <sighs> the way that you want to be loved and then it uh, still doesn't? Oh, uh, exactly. Or when the feelings are not matched. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Has that ever happened? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, God, it's so painful. Mm-hmm. It's so painful. Almost more, maybe, or more acute, a different flavor of pain. <laughs> when you've had it good, 
And then it sours and then it changes or it goes away or it's not matched because it's like, oh, I want more of that. And do you think that um, that's based upon how you and I were raised? (laughs) The longing? Or the dream that never was, like Uh dreaming for something that maybe wasn't ever, that person wasn't ever capable of doing for us. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Superimposing a dream onto reality. Mm -hmm. Right? Or trying to make it into something that it's not. Yes. Yes. And coming to a place of recognizing that the other person is just incapable. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that that's okay, yep. that they're incapable because I'm they're I'm incapable role... of doing things too. <laughs> well, yeah. I yeah. mean, we all have our areas, but it's like um, my my teacher, high school teacher, uh, who I'm still friends with, said, in time, my hope for you, I know, really so cool. My hope for you in time is that you will be able to feel gratitude for these wounded teachers and the lessons that they had to offer you. Mm. And in the moment, I was like, fuck you. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's tempered over the last couple of weeks. And I agree. I really do. Because everyone is a teacher. Everyone's a teacher. And they have agreed on some level to dance with us mm-hmm. so that we can remember that this is not about someone else doing the work for us, someone else giving us the worth that we have intrinsically inside. This is about us coming home and loving ourselves. So all of the parts, all of the parts, even the shitty ones, especially the shitty ones, because they're the ones that hide behind the curtain and do all of the poking that trip us up when we're out trying to live our best lives. Or even as I'm starting to realize as I get older, the things that I thought I knew that I really... (laughs) I only scratched the tip of the iceberg about Uh myself. Uh Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like not to be cliche about it being a journey, (laughs) a -hmm. process, not a destination, but there is such a gift in being in a body for time over time, earth time, right? We spend so much time being like, oh God, the wrinkles, the gray hair, like I'm falling apart. And in reality, it's like, no, this is a teacher too. Like this is such a gift, this process of being able to weather many storms and to see that you are perhaps bruised but not crushed, to be able to rise again from the ashes of your own learnings and these relationships where we have these these people that have shown us in such startling clarity where our next learning points are. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say that every relationship has the propensity to do that, or at least all of the major ones, yes. right? The significant ones. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Agree. How can we incorporate more love in our lives, Jamie? Ooh. Yeah. I think for me, that just immediately says spaciousness again. again. Oh, yeah. Like, go slow. This is what my therapist tells me all the time. Thank you, Magical Patrick. Go slow. Take space. Because it's in that space and it's in that slowing down that we are able to start hearing the voice of our heart, right? And that is never going to give us a bum steer. That is what actually is the seat of faith. I feel like really, really faith is taking that leap to act on the guidance of our own heart and our own inner GPS that we can only really hear when we give ourselves space and permission to slow down. And to know ourselves more. Yeah. 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 I feel like, again, back to the age, as I get older, I just keep learning more (laughs) about myself. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think earlier in my life, my focus was so projected outwards about what had happened to me or what other people had done to me or how other people were impacting me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as I get older, the reflection of who I am, why I am the way that I am, all of the contributing factors Mm. to how I became the way that I am. I just get to know that in such a different way and show up to it or relate to it in Mm. a different way Mm -hmm. um, and not make it other people's fault. Yeah. Yeah but really start to embrace it and Mm. recognize that I, in taking responsibility for that, have the power then to be 
more embodied in it, more truthful, more honest, mm-hmm. um, show up differently, yeah. pivot, yeah, um, taking responsibility for every single layer as I start to unfold mm-hmm. even or unpack even more um, has given me the ability to have more compassion for not only myself, but for the person that's in front of me who maybe is at a different place in their journey. Right. Ooh. Right. Yeah. Or is just not taking the journey. You know, we all have free will. Not everybody takes the time to do the work, the internal work, mm-hmm. or to learn the lessons that they came here to le- learn, but um, that it's really given me more patience mm. mm-hmm. and more grace and more humility around other people's ways that they're showing up. Yeah. 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 And that is such a really useful perspective to share, I feel like, because it can be hard to extrapolate the gifts from your own pain when you're in the middle of the pain, the pain Mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, you can't see it. (laughs) You can't. And so again, like that time and that spaciousness to just slow down. So you can feel all the feelings without having to externalize them, project them, act on them, you know, but just to sit with yourself (laughs) and then be able to see, Oh, they didn't show up in this way. Here's the gift. And them not showing up this way, I no longer need to keep myself attached to the fact that they were operating in this capacity. It's okay. They did the best they could (laughs) with the tools that they had. Had at that time. Yep. Yep. And we'll continue to. Yeah. As we all will. Yeah. (laughs) But as I tell my son, sometimes my best, it feels shitty. And I have to be okay with that and just love myself especially then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think you also, back to the spaciousness, at least my experience, I think a lot of the times the reason why there wasn't any spaciousness or room is because I didn't feel safe or secure Mm. in my environment. Mm. And there wasn't any room for spaciousness. There wasn't any room for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so hard when you have that early imprinting. Um, If you don't also have a native curiosity or get enough woof wake up calls in life to sort of jump the track of that initial programming, right? Because we can get stuck in that spiral of like, because this didn't happen, then I can't now, right? And, and, And it's totally understandable. And yet, you look at some of these monks, Thich Nhat Hanh, for example, who just spent so much time in war-torn areas uh, and experienced war himself. And like, wow, he's so compassionate. He's so gentle. He's so kind. He's so good humored. It's like, <gasps> how do you, in spite of, or maybe because of these profound experiences, come to rest in this place of profound compassion and acceptance and love. Mm-hmm. We well, have to find safety and security in yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so here we are. <laughs> 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 Loving everything. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. Mm-hmm. We've been talking for a while. Yeah, we've been talking for a really long time. I'm not surprised. I'm not either. We <laughs> you may have to just, edit this. <laughs> yeah, we, no, we probably will have to maybe do another one. Two episodes, mm-hmm. you know, just split it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for thank you. sharing everything and thank mm. you for being vulnerable mm. and thank you for telling parts of your story that are maybe difficult to navigate and or have a lot of feelings around them. So I appreciate that about you and your vulnerability. Thank you. Yeah, I I feel very safe here. And I also just want to say that the reason it's possible is because there is so much space in the diversity of human experience (laughs) (laughs) that as getting older, you know, you start to see, wow, everybody has different ways of getting back to the same home base right inside of themselves. So thanks for having me on your show. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you, Jamie. Of course. Mm